Greetings, welcome to DAU's AI video learning series. Today we're going to discuss how a beer with friends led to a brawl between two neural networks which became known as generative adversarial networks. All right, so as the story goes, Ian Goodfill and his friends went out for drinks at the bar. Now, Ian had the idea to pit two neural networks against each other, placing them in a kind of competition where they would learn from each other. His friends were very skeptical that this would work. I mean, after all, it's hard enough to train one neural network, let alone train two neural networks. And truth be told, Ian was a little skeptical himself, but nevertheless, with his inhibitions lowered possibly by the alcohol, he ventured to give this a go. Now, you can think of his idea kind of like a boxing match between neural networks, where the two neural networks would use each other for sparring partners to each get better as they went. So in this corner, we have the generator. Now, she is a typical convolutional neural network that's going to generate images. And in this corner, we have the discriminator. And the discriminator's job is to look at the images that the generator generates and determine whether they're real or whether they're fake. Now, his plan was to give the discriminator a little nudge in the direction he wanted the networks to go. Let's say he wanted the generator to generate realistic faces. So he'd give a relatively small amount of labeled training data, you know, some real faces to the discriminator and have the discriminator try to determine whether they were real or fake. Now this helped get things off in the right direction. And then he would let the two networks spar against each other, learning as they went along, both getting as good as they could possibly get. Now Ian went home that night after drinking and coded these models up and lo and behold, his idea worked on the very first try. He called these generative adversarial networks. And they have led to the lifelike imagery that we enjoy today with generative AI. All right, so to help you better understand how these networks work, I'm gonna take a bit of pedagogical liberty here. I'm gonna use auto encoders, decoders, uh, which really aren't part of the GAN story, but they're gonna really help you understand how the deep convolutional generative adversarial networks work. And they, these are called DC GANs. Now DC GANs evolved from Ian's original GAN uh, about a year or so after he came up with this original GAN. And they, DC GANs, became the backbone of image generating GANs that we know today. So it'll, it'll be worth our, our time to, to understand this. Now autoencoders, you can think of them as, as an image encoder and a decoder. So if you take an image, and you put it in the encoder side, it convolves it down to a one-dimensional representation. Then on the decoder side, it takes it and builds it right back up to its original form. You can kind of think of it as a zip file for images. It zips it down to a one-dimensional representation, and then it unzips it right back up to the, uh, to the original image. Now, if you watch my videos, uh, How AI Learns to See Parts 1 and 2, you're already familiar with the left half uh, the convolutional half of, of how these images get reduced. But let's take a quick review of convolutions. All right, recall you can think of a convolutional filter as a neuron wired to a kernel that's much smaller than the image that it convolves. And this kernel stepped across the image and the filter's output incrementally builds a new, usually lower resolution uh, map that we call a feature map. Now, since we don't use padding or pulling like, like we did in how an AI learns to see part two with the presidential model, then the, the image actually gets smaller. So as you do the convolution, the resulting feature map gets smaller as you go. And this is how the left side uh, reduces that re resolution down to a single vector. All right, in autoencoders, decoders, uh, you want to re uh, reproduce the images at some point. So the pooling and the uh, padding, like we used in, in the presidential model, that's not used. In pooling, you want to get down to a one dimension really quick, quickly and you downsample. You lose a lot of details when you downsample like that. So usually in these kind of networks where you want to reproduce the image at some point, you don't you don't downsample like that. You use the convolution to take you down, which makes for a lot more layers. So I'm only showing three layers here, um, but there'd be many more layers in the convolutional side. And then also in the presidential model, when we went to the sink, when we went through the flattening layer and we came over here to the one dimensional representation, you can think of that as the middle of the autoencoder decoder. Okay, so now you understand the left side. Let's talk about the right side. We're going to use something called a transposed convolution to upsample. And it's, it's, uh, you can almost think of it as a reverse convolution. Uh, sometimes people get mad when I call it a deconvolution because that's mathematically not what's happening. But this representation here shows you pretty easily what's happening mathematically. One single input from the map that it's going to uh, transpose uh, is taken into the neuron. Now we still have the activation function like we know and love, like typically a ReLU. 
and then one input turns into many outputs. So you have a kernel size of three by three, so you'd have nine outputs. And each one of these outputs has a parameter associated with it, and that output from that neuron gets multiplied for the parameter, and its corresponding output gets placed in the resulting feature map as it's upscaled. Okay, let's walk through a little example of this. So let's say we have a two by two with the value shown there, and we're going to transpose that into a four by four. So that one goes through the neuron, the activation function gets multiplied by the weight, comes into a one, and in each case, one times one is one, one times one is one, one times one is one, one times one is one. So those four ones come out, and then we step that to the next one with a stride of two, kernel size of two, and then the twos come out. Step that again, we get three. Step that again, we get fours. Now notice how the kernel doesn't overlap on the output feature map. And this is usually by design with these kind of networks. If they overlapped, uh, mathematically, it's not difficult. You know, every time that, that parameter output touches one of those values on that output map, they simply sum together. Um, however, that overlap sometimes call, causes uh, unwanted artifacts in the output image. So, so usually that's avoided in these kind of networks. Okay, so that's the right side of the autoencoder. And now you understand the left side. You zip them down, you zip them back up. Now you wonder, well, Dave, why in the world did you tell me about autoencoders? Yeah, I got it. They're easy to understand. But what's that got to do with GANs? Well, if we take this guy and we rearrange it a little bit, on the left side, we've got the generator, and on the right side, we've got the discriminator. Now, we also added a head over here, a fully connected layer, and we need that to give, give the discriminator the brain power to determine real or fake. And that is pretty much our GAN right there in a nutshell. Input comes in. You can think of that as a prompt. That prom, prompt gets upscaled into an image. So let's say create a face, create a happy face. Here's a happy face. The discriminator looks at that. Uh, convolves it all the way down, gives it to the flat, flattens it out, gives it to the fully connected layer, and it determines real or fake. Okay, if it says real, then it's fooled it, because this is a fake image because it's a, you know, it's an artificial network. Uh, so if it says real, it's fooled, it backpropagates and adjusts all its weights so it can make a better decision next time. If it says fake, then it, it was able to determine that that was a fake image. And this network generates a loss function and all the, the weights are adjusted as we back propagate and adjust all the weights here. So next time the generator could generate a better image. So you might look at this and say, all right, Dave, so what, what gets them started along the face route? I kind of understand this, but why don't they generate um, cars or trucks or horses or birds? Or how do you get them started for faces? All right. And how that happens is you train the discriminator with a, a relatively small data set of real faces. So you give it some real faces uh, in the training data and it makes decisions on whether these are real or fake. And if it says real, great, you keep it going in that direction. If it says fake, then you back propagate and you adjust all its weights. And once it's got you know, an idea of what real faces look like, then it can critique the generator's outputs. Well, in the beginning, we randomize all the weights of all these filters in the, in the generator. Usually, we even put in random noise for the prompt. And so you can imagine the output is pretty much a, kind of a mess. And so in the beginning, it's relatively easy when you give the, uh, the generator faces to the discriminator for it to say fake. But nevertheless, you let these two spar like this and go on and on and on, and they quickly converge, and the generator starts generating some pretty realistic images. And they kind of come to this little equilibrium after they spar with each other for a while, uh, each doing the best job it could possibly do. And that has led to the realistic images that we see today. This is an image from NVIDIA's StyleGAN. You can go to thispersondoesnotexist.com, and you can generate images of people, well, not people, all day long. And I challenge you to tell that these are people or not people. They look so incredibly realistic. And these are a direct descendant of these GANs. And now you pretty much understand everything you need to know to, uh, to understand how these uh, generative adversarial networks work. All right, so large language model, please summarize this video for me. This video provided a comprehensive introduction to generative adversarial networks. GANs, delving into the groundbreaking concept introduced by Ian Goodfellow. It used the autoencoder-decoder framework to explain deep convolutional GANs, DCGANs, and the pivotal role of transposed convolutions. 
By charting the journey from the inception of GANs to modern advancements like Style GAN, we gained insights into one of RE's most captivating domains, responsible for some of the finest generative images today. If you'd like to take any of DAU's AI courses and earn credit toward an official AI training credential, click here. Or if for whatever reason that doesn't work, in the, in the description below, you'll see the link to that. Thanks a bunch for watching, and please check out the other videos in our series. And if you like that, please like and subscribe.